When you look at exercises for plantar fasciitis, you can usually divide them into stretches as well as strength training or control exercises. Now, this video is about the strength training and control exercises because I've made a previous one about stretches for plantar fasciitis and you can get that link in the description of this video. So what we're going to look at is general guidelines and how these exercises actually benefit your plantar fasciitis or your plantar fascia. Then we're going to look at my top 10 exercises, but I'm going to divide them between early rehab, mid rehab and late stage rehab, because obviously your exercises have to suit the um, way you are in your recovery process. And then lastly, I'll also mention an app that you can use to help guide you through your rehab process if you actually want a bit more guidance and more choice of exercises. I've helped develop the Exact Health app and you can get a discount code to use it for one month free. So have a look at the description of this video if you want more details on that as well. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mareka. I'm one of the physiotherapists from sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment for your injuries. Have a look at the description of this video if you want a link to our website. So how do exercises that help build strength and control in your legs and your ankle actually help your plantar fasciitis. So it's through two ways. One is it helps to strengthen your plantar fascia again and two it helps prevent it from coming back. So let's dig into both of those a little bit in more detail. Let's first look at how strength training exercises and control exercises helps your plantar fascia to recover. Now it's useful to understand what the plantar fascia does. If you look at the plantar fascia, it's underneath your foot and its main job is to stop your foot arch from collapsing whenever you actually place weight through your foot. So it works really hard when you're standing, walking, running, jumping, all of those activities, anything where you put weight through your feet, your plantar fascia is working. Now, once it's injured, it actually loses some of its strength and endurance. So it can no longer really cope with all the activities you've done in the past. It's obviously also on a sliding scale that somebody who's had it for a long time or really overdid things, their plantar fascia may have very little capacity to cope with standing. So even standing for a few minutes may be really, really painful. Whereas other people may not feel much pain when they run or when they stand or walk. It's only when they run that they get pain. So we, everybody with this injury has a varying degree of strength and endurance and sensitivity in the plantar fascia. Now, the only way to improve your strength and your endurance in that plantar fascia is through doing strength training exercises because they stimulate the body to rebuild that area and produce new and stronger cells again. None of the other treatments can give you strength in your feet. They can really help things like massage and stretching and all of those other things can help with pain and it can help give you short-term pain relief. But if you want to regain the strength in your plantar fascia, you have to do exercises that strengthens them. The second thing it does is it can help prevent plantar fasciitis from coming back. Now, how does this work? It's useful to think of your body as a kinetic chain. So when you run, walk, stand, any movement you do, what happens in one part of the body affects the other. So if you have weaknesses or some of the muscles just don't work as well higher up in your legs, like the glutes for instance, then that can cause more strain on your plantar fascia. A typical example is if your leg turns in too much when you run or walk because you've got weak glutes, that then causes the foot to roll in and strains the plantar fascia more. So by making sure that you've got good control and good strength in the rest of your body, you can actually reduce the um, strain on your plantar fascia. Now, for rehab exercises to be effective, they really have to suit you. Like I mentioned before, injuries, even if they have the same name and it's essentially the same type of injury, they all have a different level of sensitivity, a different, different level of severity. So we have to pitch the exercises just right. And there are a few things that you can do to help you figure out how to pitch these right. Now, the first thing to understand is that the exercises I'm demonstrating in this video later are not the only ones you can do. And they may not be right for you. So if you struggle with them or they just don't work for you, speak to a physio because they can actually help you choose the best things for you for the moment you're in. So how do you actually know what stage of recovery you're in? Now, the obvious thing that people think of is, oh no, I've got to scan it because then I'll see where I am. 
Now, scans don't actually tell you anything. They tell us broadly what type of injury it is, but it doesn't tell us any about, anything about the strength of the tissue or its tolerance. So the best way to gauge where you are in your recovery period or what exercise it will tolerate is to notice what level of pain you have when you move or what, because sometimes it's not even about the tissue strength, it's more about the sensitivity. And you've got to pitch the exercise to the sensitivity so that that can calm down. Now, it is actually quite easy to figure this out. It's all about the best method is start with the easiest possible exercises. So things that's really unlikely to irritate it. And then you build from there. So if you find that oh, these are so stupid, I can do them easily, they're not a bother, brilliant. That means you can quickly move up. But if your foot is sensitive, you may find them even a challenge and then you've started at the right level. So I always advocate start lower because these injuries often only show you hours later that you've overdone it. So what I've done in this video is I have divided the exercises into early stage. So I would really tell you to everybody just test those exercises first. And if you're really sure that they are right, then you move on. So then I've given you exercises for mid stage and later stage, and I've given you um, progression criteria to know when to move on to those. The second thing that's important is that your exercises and rehab plan should match your goals. Now, I think we can all agree that a person who only wants to walk for exercise or daily life needs a different level of strength compared to somebody who actually wants to do sports where you run or jump. So when we look at the rehab plan and the exercises these people have to do, they usually all start with the same type of things and even mid-stage rehab may be the same. But then towards the later stages where we're really preparing you to get back to your sport, that will look very different. So for somebody who does running sports or jumping sports, you will have to do plyometric things where you jump and hop in your last stages. Somebody who just walks and has no interest in that really doesn't have to do those. And to be honest, they can cause themselves an injury if they're not used to hopping. So it's really important that you figure out what are your goals and that your physio helps decide what's the right level for you to build up to that. To help you decide with the exercises in this video, which ones will suit who, I've discussed with each exercise also who may want to do it, who it may be appropriate for and who doesn't need it. Another important thing to think about is how often should you do your exercises? Now, people are often really dedicated to their rehab and they want to get better. So they tend to think the more I do it, the better. So how many times a day should I do it? Whoa, stop. Usually only once and not every day. And the reason for this is because our bodies require time to actually react to the exercise. Whenever we do exercise and even just daily activities, it stimulates some micro damage into our tissues. So our bones, our muscles, our ligaments, everything. And this is normal and actually what we want. Because what this does is the body then uses the time after that exercise to go, oh, okay, we've got a little bit of micro damage. So this means you're not strong enough for what you want to do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna repair this micro damage and I'm gonna make it stronger than before. So now you can do that activity without causing any. And this is how we grow stronger over time. But the problem is, if you don't allow that recovery period to take place, then the micro damage actually accumulates and it causes injuries like plantar fasciitis or other types of injuries. So it's really important to respect your recovery times. Now, the basic rule is that if it's a low load exercise, they don't cause much micro damage. They usually just improves your circulation and stimulates the, the um, nervous system and the muscles to work a bit. Those can usually do, be done once, twice a day, even sometimes, but it's usually safe to do them, to only give them eight to 24 hours rest between. If it becomes a higher load exercise, where you actually start to fatigue the muscles and you can feel that you're working, now those usually require 48 hours um, of recovery time. I will also say, if an injury is quite sensitive, then sometimes those, the pain can get oversensitive and it can get triggered really easily. In those cases, it can also help to go a little bit slower with the rehab. Not because you're not recovering well, but because we have to calm that oversensitive pain system down. So what I'll do is with the exercises as well, when I demonstrate them, I'll tell you which ones you likely want to be um, leaving more recovery time between and which ones you can do daily and which ones are really just for circulation you can do more often. 
Something else to think about is that what is classed as a high load exercise is really relative to your own fitness and strength. So for instance, for somebody who doesn't do exercise at all, actually just doing double leg heel raises, a high volume of that, may be a high load exercise. Whereas for the next person who runs and usually does strength training, double leg heel raises does nothing for them. It's just a circulatory exercise. So it's also about your fitness levels. And I do mention about fitness levels in the exercise demos as well for you. An important thing to keep in mind when you do your exercises is how much pain is actually okay to have during the exercise, but also in the hours afterwards. Because something to remember is that often these type of injuries feel absolutely fine while you're doing your exercises, but then about six, seven hours later, suddenly it's a lot more painful. So we've got to monitor both the pain or discomfort you feel while doing it, plus what happens in the hours afterwards. Now, what the research is showing is that it's absolutely fine to feel some discomfort while you're doing your exercises. So three out of 10 discomfort or, or just a slight, I can feel my foot discomfort is absolutely fine. As long as when you stop the exercise, that extra discomfort calms down and goes away and you just feel your normal levels of pain and you feel regardless of whether you do exercise. And then also in the 24 hours afterwards, you don't want to see a significant increase in your pain. So if you walk, wake up the next morning and you think, oh, my foot feels so much more stiff or uncomfortable when I walk compared to yesterday, then whatever you did yesterday was likely too much for it. And you've got to do less. And this doesn't just have to be your exercise. It can also be how much you walked, how much other things you did. But if you wake up the next day, and you think, ah, it feels the same as every as every day it's a bit uncomfortable but that's how it felt yesterday before i did my exercises then your exercises were likely pitched at the right level so the other important thing to understand is if you do wake up and you think ah oh, my foot is really painful today it doesn't mean that you've made your injury worse what happens is the body tries to warn you before you actually worsen your injury so if your activity that you did yesterday wasn't a massive step up from what you used to or you've been doing in the last couple of weeks, you've just done a little bit more and now you've got so much more pain, it's just the body making it more sensitive and creating a bit of pain to see if it can get you to take things easier. However, if you did do a dramatic lot more of exercise and activity yesterday compared to what you've been doing in the last couple of days and now it's flared up, then you may have made it worse. So if you're worried about it, see a physio, consult a physio and just get it assessed so that they can tell you what the best thing to do is. Now, if you feel that whew, there are a few things to keep in mind here and you would like more help with your rehab, check out the Exact Health app. I've helped design the app to guide you through this process. So what happens is it starts you at the easiest level of exercises and then it uses your feedback about your pain and how difficult you find the exercises to adjust your rehab plan for you and suggest what's the best next step in it. And then it also sets very specific criteria for you to tick the boxes before you can move on to the next level. And at the moment, you can get a month free subscription with it if you use the discount code. Have a look at the description of this video if you want a link to that and the discount code wrote, written down. Let's talk about plantar fasciitis exercises for early rehab. Now, who can do these? These are good starter exercises for everybody usually. Doesn't matter what your fitness level is, these should be applicable to everybody. The first exercise are the toe grabs. Now, I have no idea what you call them really. That's just what I call them because that's what you do. Why I like this exercise is it helps to strengthen the little muscles inside the foot. So they are meant to help support the plantar fascia in its job to support the arch. And second, it also improves the circulation in the area of the injury, which gets rid of lots of the toxins that's created in there that can actually improve, um, cause the pain if they accumulate. So by improving your circulation, it can lower your pain for several hours afterwards. So what you need is you need a slippery surface because you're gonna put a towel on there that you want to grab with your toes. And if it's not slippery enough, it's really hard work. So preferably if you have a tiled floor or wooden floor, if you don't have any of that, it also helps to put a magazine or a book that you, underneath it that you can put the towel on because that allows to slide. Then you want to sit on a sturdy surface. Chair works well. If you want to sit on the bed, you can do that as well. It doesn't really matter. And you want to place your foot on that towel. And then the aim here 
is to grab the towel with all your toes and just pull it up and release and pull it up and release. Now, depending on how sensitive your foot is, it may not like you to try and grab as hard as you can and hold it and release it. That may actually cause it to be, be sore or it can cause it to cramp. It's really common to feel a cramp with this exercise. If that happens, don't, don't try and do it as um, hard. Just do gentle grabs. It doesn't matter if you don't move the tail much at the beginning. As you get going and over several days, this will start to feel better. If you do get a cramp, just gently bend your toes and everything back and that will help to release that, that cramp as well. Something else you can do is if it cramps, you can just roll your foot a little bit on a ball. That sometimes helps as well. So how many repetitions do you want to do? Usually I tend to tell my patients to do about 10 repetitions and then just rest for about 30 seconds or do the other foot if you want and repeat that anywhere between three and six times. Now, whenever you start a new exercise, go for the lower level and check that 24 delayed response, 24 hour response to this and then decide whether you do more or less, see what works for you. How often can you do these? These are low load exercises. You can do them every day and if you wanted to do them twice a day, you could or something else that may work better is if you actually see it, say, well, I want to do six sets of 10 repetitions in the day, so let's break it up. You feel free to break it up that you do three sets in the morning, three sets later in the day. See what works best for you. My second exercise that I like during the early stage is to start introducing some double leg heel raises. Now, what do they do? They are a good starter exercise for strengthening the plantar fascia and the calf muscles. Now, remember, if your calves are strong, they may find it easy, but your plantar fascia may not find it easy. So just start with these and start gently with them. Second, they help to develop the control in your ankles, which also helps with the control when you run and walk and can reduce the strain there. And then thirdly, it can help improve your circulation, which can help to decrease your pain in the, long, uh, in the short term as well. Now, I prefer to ask my patients to wear shoes with these when their plantar fascia is really painful because it can do with that extra bit of support. Now, when I say shoes, I don't mean flat shoes like flip-flops. I want them to wear supportive shoes like running shoes, for instance. Hokas are good for that or um, uh, Asics are also good supportive shoes if you're looking for something. But just something that gives you a tiny bit of arch support that, it's, um, that it helps the plantar fascia. Then you also need something sturdy to hold on to because this is not a balance exercise. And if you're going to struggle to keep your balance when you're up there, you may actually strain your plantar fascia. So the, the focus in this exercise, the birds are really singing loudly. I hope you don't hear them too much. The focus in this exercise is to actually control the movement really well at the ankle level. So hold on that you can do that properly. So what we do? is you want to hold onto a sturdy object and then you just want to lift slowly up on your toes and slowly back down. Now when you lift, you want to look at your what your heels are doing. You don't want to swing out at the top. You want to keep it nice and level that you feel the same pressure between the ball of your big toe, ball of your little toe. Also, you do not have to lift as high as a ballerina. We're just looking to introduce this movement. So if it hurts to lift all the way up, Go to where you can lift, even if it's just a tiny bit. It really doesn't matter. At this point, we just need to get movement through it. As your injury recovers, as it settles down, you can start to lift up higher if you want to. Um, the reason to go so slowly is that really helps to work on your control. So if you go really fast, you're not getting much benefit control-wise. Um, so try to slow it down. Try to make it nice and control as you go up and down. Repetition wise, a good place to start is with about 10 repetitions. Give it a minute's rest, do three sets, then you check your 24 hour pain response. If it increased your pain significantly the next morning, you have to do fewer repetitions. So you're allowed to calm down and the next time you test it, you only do three sets of five repetitions. However, if it felt easy and you didn't have any increase in pain, you can slowly start to build the number of repetitions. Because what I want you to aim to build up for most people is eventually to get to three sets of 20 of these um, without it increasing your pain and with good control. Who can do this? How often can you do this? If you're quite fit and your plantar fascia isn't that sensitive, 
you can usually do these every day because they're not that hard work for somebody who's fit and if the plantar fascia is not sensitive. However, if you're not somebody who does regular strength training or running type exercises or aren't that fit, then I would do them every second day. Also, if your plantar fascia is quite sensitive, I would possibly start with them every second day as well. But these are rough rules. See what works best for you and always look at that 24 hour pain response. The third type of exercise I give in the early stage of rehab are balancing exercises. Now, you may think, why do we do balancing exercises for plantar fasciitis? Well, it's because the plantar fascia carries all the weight when you're standing on one leg or most of the weight. And through doing balancing exercises, you can retrain its ability to accept that load. Also, it helps with control. It's the most basic thing that can teach you really good control at your hip, your pelvis, your knee and your ankle. So it's a brilliant starter exercise. What you need for this is if your plantar fascia is really sensitive, again, I would wear shoes. If it's not that sensitive, you can do them in bare feet, but just on a soft mat for me. It's harder to do them in bare feet. So if you struggle with it, start with shoes on and then move to bare feet. Also, at the beginning, I want you to hold on to something, even if it's just a hand against a wall. Because what this does is it helps to stabilize you that there are two elements to this exercise. One is, is the plantar fascia happy to take the load? The second is, can I control it? So let's take the control out first and see if the plantar fascia is happy with it by actually helping it with the control by holding on. And then once you see, ah, plantar fascia can carry this, then you take your hand off the wall so it now has to also start balancing so it increases the load a little bit. So let's see how we do this. You first hold a hand on the wall and then you shift your weight over to one side, lift the one leg up and then you balance on one leg. And you're looking at knees stay in a straight line with the middle of the foot and you don't want your ankle to roll in. Now start with really short holds the first time you test it. So only 10 seconds, sit down, rest or do the other leg and repeat that three times and then check your 24 hour response. What you're looking to build up for to over several session, sessions is that you get to 30 seconds balancing on one leg and 30 seconds without a hand on a wall. So you're just looking straight ahead and you're keeping your ankle lovely and still and there's no real wobble there. At that point, you'll be ready to move on to the next one of those. Who can do these exercises and how often? Well, even if you're really fit, I would say only do them every second day. And this is because they're not hard work for the body, but they're actually hard work for the plantar fascia. So it's best not to work it too many times in a row um, because then it can cause it to become more sensitive. So I usually tell my patients every second day, three times a week max, that's pretty much what I want them to aim for with this exercise. I usually also add in some form of a squat for my patients. Now I prefer box squats because they really teach you a good movement pattern for squats. And why do you always want to do squats? Well, they strengthen your glutes, your quads, your hamstrings, and they develop good movement patterns for you in your legs. So if you think of when you walk, you run, you jump, all of those are essentially similar movements to the squat pattern, but just on one leg. So double leg squats is a really good place to start because you can concentrate on what your feet are doing, what your knees are doing, what your hips are doing, and really start to correct yourself. What you need for this exercise is you need a chair or a high box, or you can even use a high bed if you like. The key here is the surface we're looking for is about a surface that allows 90 degree bend in your knees. Now, if you find that you can't control it properly to that level, you need a slightly higher surface. So then you just put some um, cushions on top of the chair or on top of the bench that you're using until it's at a level that you can really control the movement all the way down. So there's no plonking down and all the way back up again. And what you want to do is you just stand with your feet hip distance apart. They don't have to point straight forward. They can be slightly out depending on, on what's comfortable for you. You want your, your backs of your legs nearly touching the chair or the box that you're using. So not leaning against it, but just a little bit away from it. Also, make sure that whatever you're using, if it's a chair especially, that it's against a wall. So don't, it can't slip away from under you when you go to sit down. And then the key here is to really push your bottom far out of the back 
and you can lean forwards. So I like to have my hands in front, but if you put them out in front of you, they can help you balance as well. And you stick your bottom out to the back and you touch it gently onto the surface. And then you come back up. So you're not sitting there for ages. You're just gently coming back up again. Now, the whole time that you're doing this, you're thinking about where are my knees moving? You want them moving in the middle of your feet um, or the pointing in the middle of your feet. So if your feet are pointing out, they, your knees also have to point slightly out to stay in the middle. Also, what am I doing with my ankles and my feet? Am I allowing them to actually roll in as I go to sit down that last bit? So have a look at that. Now, sometimes when people have really tight calf muscles or their ankles are just tight, people with high arches sometimes have really stiff dorsiflexion. They won't be able to keep their feet totally flat all the way down. So you can, if you wear a running shoe or something that has a little bit of a heel to it, that can help you squat more easily, or you can just put a rolled up towel under your heels to help lift that. How many repetitions? Three sets of 10 is usually enough. So you want to do, be able to do slow 10 repetitions, rest for a minute and repeat that three times. Now, if you're not somebody who does regular strength training exercise or exercise, Three sets of 10 may be too, much, too many for you to start with, so start with three sets of six and just work up to that. If you're on the fitter side, you may be able to get away with that quite easily and move on to the next one, but it will also depend on how sensitive your plantar fasciitis is at the moment, because this position also places more strain on that. So when you do these exercises, and if you do them all in one day or in one session, they all accumulate the load on your plantar fascia. So if you get to the next morning, you feel, oh, it's quite uncomfortable. It's usually not just one exercise that did it. It will be the combination. So reduce all of them a little bit. Or if you want to figure out which one was the culprit, just do one. Check how you respond to that dose. If it's okay, you know this one's okay. So let's move on to the next. Test them, test them, test them. And then you eventually know what load is okay. And if you put them together... Is your foot still happy with that? If not, then you know, okay, perhaps I need to split them or do even fewer repetitions of each when I do them all in one go so the total load is lower. I hope that makes sense. Looking at mid-stage rehab exercises for plantar fasciitis, the first one there are single leg calf raises, so going up and down on one, on one leg. Now, when can you start these? You can usually start these when you are able to do three sets of 20 of the double leg ones I spoke about in the previous section without increasing your pain and being able to do them really quite easily and with good form. Now, when you do the single leg ones, I usually prefer my patients to do them with shoes on or if they're gonna do them without shoes, you have to be on a soft surface because otherwise you're gonna injure the front, the ball of your foot. You can do them either to floor level, so just on the floor as normal, and if you find them difficult to control, that may be the best place to start, or you can do them over the side of a step. Often it's best to just test the easier version or the less controlled ver version, the one that le needs less control first, and if you find that easy, you can try the other one, because if this one then flares it up, you know it's just because it's over the step. So what we're doing is you want to hold on to something really solid, because this is again not a balancing exercise, you're looking to focus on getting the strength through the leg that you don't lose your balance. Because this exercise is meant to strengthen your calf muscles as well as your plantar fascia and it helps develop some control in that ankle. So you want to hold on to something um, stable, shift your weight over, lift one leg off the floor and make sure that your pelvis stays nice and level. And then you slowly start lifting up and down on your toes. But again, Check that you're carrying that weight equally. So you want to feel when you go up that you don't twist your foot to the outside, for instance, that the weight is equal between your ball of your big toe, ball of your little toe. You don't have to lift too high, go as high as it's comfortable. As your injury recovers, you can try and get your full range with that. But the key here is again, slow up, slow down, not just plonking up and down like that. We're looking for the control. I would always start with a small set because this is a lot more weight or load than the double leg one. So always start with like three sets of eight or three sets of 10 and just check the 24 hour response and then build up to where you can do three sets of 15 easily without increasing your pain and without uh, with good control. Then you're ready to move on to the next one. Now, 
you may see that some people say, oh, you've got to do these exercises for plantar fasciitis with a rolled up towel under the, the toes. It's not really needed. The reason people say that is there was one study that came out where the researchers looked at, they had a theory that because if you do it with a towel under the toes, it puts more stress on the plantar fascia, so that will work it harder, so it will be appropriate for people to um, recover with that. So they tested what would happen if people use these type of exercises with the towel under, would they get better? Yeah, they did get better, so they can work, but they didn't have a control, so they didn't test them versus the, the normal heel raises, which also works. So these ones with the towel under aren't better than the other ones, they do just work. I tend to not use the rolled up towel or anything under the toes because it often irritates the toes and it's a little bit more complicated to control properly. So I tend to go for simple things where it's easy to control and gets results. So feel free to put a rolled up towel under there if you want, but in my opinion, it's not needed. Then who should do these and how often? If you tick the box of you can do your three sets of 20 of the previous ones, Everybody can start with these as long as you can do those the previous ones But these are higher load ones So I would say maximum three times a week with at least one full rest day in between so that gives you 24 uh, 48 hours actually because so typically you'll do them Monday Wednesday Friday um, And then you'll have nice two days to fully recover over the weekend But if you're not so fit and you find these exercises quite hard or your plantar fascia needs a little bit more time to recover between sessions then only do them twice a week. So like on a, on a Tuesday and what would that be? Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah, so you've got two rest days in between. So you can get better even if you just do them twice a, a week and it may be better suited to some people to do them fewer times rather than more. But don't do them twice in a row. If you missed your session, you think, oh, I've got to fit one in, just leave it out. You're better off doing less than overworking it because remember, plantar fasciitis is an overload exercise. For balancing exercises during the mid-stage, you want to start making them a little bit more difficult. So one of my favorites is balancing on one leg and starting to turn your head. Now, what this does is it just helps to um, improve the control in your leg and your foot and help the plantar fascia cope with that little wobble that you tend to get. Um, why it's more difficult is because our balancing system is actually made up of your inner ear plus your eyes, the feedback there, plus messages your body get, gets or your brain gets back from your foot and your, your body. So what happens when you start turning your head is now your brain can't really rely on your ears and it can't rely that much on your eyes. It has to start relying more on the feedback it gets from your body. And that's good because when you're running and walking, you're not looking at where you're running and walking and you're probably having a chat. So you need to retrain this bit. So what you do, you can start these exercises once you're able to balance on one leg, looking straight ahead without any hands on walls. And you can do that easily, no increase in your pain and you've got good control. So for this one, you go into exactly that same position that no hands on walls. You shift your weight over, lift one leg up and you first focus on one point. Now, once you feel you have your balance, then you slowly start turning your head side to side. Now, it's not side to side like a helicopter because that will make you dizzy and fall over. It's really slow. And if you find it hard, you don't have to turn your head as far as you can. You only take it a little bit and start with that. Also, if you lose your balance, you don't take your head to the front. If you get to there and you, you're starting to lose your balance, focus on that point, regain your balance in that point, and then move on. Now, it's important to have something solid to hold on to when you do these balancing exercises. So doing them in the um, middle of an open door where you've got sides to you that you can hold on to or next to a kitchen counter can be really useful just to steady yourself. I usually tell my patients to start with um, just short holds to see how dizzy they feel with it, but then build up to three, se three sets of 30 seconds. But rest between the seconds or the sets so that you can just make sure that you get rid of any dizziness that may have um, happened or developed while you were moving your head. Okay. How often can you do that? Three times a week, but not consecutive days. I would again say leave at least uh, one full rest day between them and 
everybody can do this one if you've already graduated from the previous exercise. Lunge dips are a really nice step up from the general squats and you can start these usually if you're able to do your three, three sets of 10 box squats on double legs easily. So what they do is they further build more strength in your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings, but they also require a lot more control. So they help to develop that control in slightly more awkward positions. I do want you to wear shoes for this because it's starting to become more of an active exercise. So um, definitely wear shoes or if you're going to do it without shoes, make sure you're on a soft surface. The key here is not to give too big a step at the start. The larger the step is that you give, the more difficult it becomes to control. So first regain control with a small step and then you can start to make them larger. So what you do is you give a step forwards so that you're in stride stand and your feet are not in a line like this, they're slightly apart. Then you start bending the front knee until you get to a 90 degree angle and you drop the back knee all the way down onto the floor. Now the girl in the, the video is actually touching her back knee to the floor. I don't want you to do that. I want you to control it properly that you stop before your knee at the back touches the floor and then you come back up again. But you keep in that position you don't step out of it again you just stay in that position so you slowly drop down and lift up for about 10 repetitions then you change legs and do it again and then you rest for about 60 seconds to two minutes and you repeat that then on each side now again if you're not that fit you may want to start with just about five repetitions on each side and build your way up to 10. Um, over time. So see how your foot reacts, see how your whole body reacts. How often can you do these? I would do them three times a week if you're on the fitter side. If you're not that fit, twice a week is more than enough. And in that case, I would actually leave two days of recovery between. Whereas if you're doing them three times a week, only one day of recovery between them. Now we're moving into the final stages of your rehab, which means the exercises in this stage needs to be difficult enough and work up to a high enough level to prepare you for getting back to your sport or the daily activities you want to be doing in daily life. Now, the first exercise here is the single leg calf raise still, but we're adding weight to it. Because when we walk and run, it's not just your body weight that goes through it. Because you're doing it at um, speed, it's actually, actually multiples of your body weight. Force is equal to multiples of your body weight that goes through it. So for running, for instance, forces between six to eight times your body weight goes through your foot. So you can't just do your heel raises with your body weight and think that that's enough. Now, you can start you adding weight usually if you're able to do three sets of 15 repetitions, single leg, with good form um, and not causing any pain in your foot. Then you're ready to add weight. So... This exercise really strengthens your plantar fascia, gives it that last bit of strength that it needs to get you back to, your, um, to the full level. It prepares it for high explosive sports and it also helps to improve your control in your ankle and your, your foot. Now the equipment you need is you need some sort of a weight. So you can use hand weights or you can use bottles of water. I like to place them in a backpack on my back because then I've got my hands free to hold on to something to balance because the heavier the weight becomes, the more difficult it is to hold on to it. Now you're thinking, how heavy should the weight be? Well, that's relative to your body weight. So if we think of a, quite a large bulk person like myself, I'm 175 centimeters versus my sister, for instance, for instance who's only 168, I think. So for me to lift five kilos relative to my body weight is much easier than for her to lift five kilos relative to her body weight. So we're looking to start everybody off with a really easy weight, but then build up to a percentage of their body weights. And I'll get to that in a bit later in a moment. <clears throat> a good way to start with to just test the foot's response is if you a slightly larger built person, taller person, um, you can usually start with a two kilo weight. If you're a smaller person, then usually one kilos or 1.5 kilos is a safer one to start with because you want to check that 24 hour response first. Now, what you build up to depends on your type of sport. If you're somebody who just wants to walk and you don't really do much impact activities, then we want to build you up 
to being able to do your single leg calf raises with a weight that's equal to about 10% of your body weight. So if like me, you weigh seven, 70 kilos, then you want to be able to eventually do it with seven kilos of weight in your backpack or in your hand. If on the other hand, you are a larger person and you weigh, uh, let's say you weigh 90 kilos, you want to work up to nine kilos. Now, if you're a runner or somebody who does jumping sports, you really should be aiming to work up to 20% of your body weight. So you want to be, if you're me and you're 70 kilos, you want to work up to where you can do those exercises with 14 kilos um, eventually. And if you somebody who's larger built, so you're 90 kilos that you weigh, then you want to get to about 18 kilos in extra weight. But I'll also explain in a minute how you decide when you can increase the weight because you've got to do that slowly. If you do it too quickly, your body doesn't actually get time to react to it and then it increases your pain. So let's first look at how you do this exercise. It's the calf raises, it's like normal. So what you do is you have your weight either in your hand or you place it in a backpack so that you've got your hands free to hold on to. Then you can do it on the floor or you can do it over the side of a step, whatever is comfortable for you. So you hold on for balance so that you don't have to struggle with keeping your balance and you start by lifting slowly up on your toes and slowly back down all the way and you just repeat that movement at a steady pace so we're not going up down up down especially the down you control nice and slowly now whenever you start with a new weight you want to start with fewer repetitions so you start with three sets of eight or three sets of ten to just check how does my foot react to this extra weight in the 24 hours after. Now, if it's absolutely fine, then in the next session, you can increase the weight a little bit. If your foot didn't feel 100% happy in the hours after, then I would repeat that session until it is happy. If, however, your foot actually felt significantly worse, I would reduce the weight in the next session and I would keep it at that level for a few set, for a few workouts and then try a small increase in weight again. So typically when you first start with the weights, you start with your one kilo or two kilos, three sets of 10, ah, it felt okay, it felt quite easy, let's increase it a bit, and you want to work up to where you can do three sets of 15 on that specific weight. Now, once you hit that, I would always repeat that session one more time to just make sure you truly, your foot is happy with it. And then you can increase your weight. So if you started with two kilos, you can now do three or four kilos in the next session, but you have to bring down your repetitions. So you start with three kilos of 10, rep 10 repetitions only, uh, three or four kilos of 10 repetitions only. And then you build that over several sessions until you get to your three sets of 15, add weight, but reduce your repetitions. So everybody, regardless of your level of fitness, should do it with extra weight, but the weight you work up to uh, will depend on what sport or what activity you want to get back to. Usually it's best to do these exercises only twice a week so that you get at least two full rest days between them because they're starting to be heavier load. However, if you're a really fit person, you may be able to do them three times a week with just one session of rest in there, but two is usually enough. And if you feel your foot is getting a bit sensitive, I would do less rather than more because whenever you're coming back from an injury, recovery time and giving in that time to rebuild is just as important as doing the exercises. The single leg box squat is one of my favorite exercises for the final stages. Why? Because it's a lovely all-in-one. It gives you really good strength in your glutes, your quads, your hamstrings. It's really hard to control. So you're developing your balance and you're really developing your control with this. And you've got lots of ways that you can make it easier at the start and then slowly get onto the full exercise. So when can you start this exercise? You can start this when you can easily do your three sets of 10 of the um, lunge dips on each leg. If you're somebody who's not that fit and don't wanna get back to running or things, you can just use a higher surface. I'll talk about that in a minute. So the things you want to, you need for this exercise is you need a stable surface. So either a dining room chair or a high box that won't slide away from you. So make sure you place it against the wall or something that it can't get away from you. The surface, the height of the surface you're looking for is something that allows you to squat up and down on one leg with good control and slow, not fall that last little bit. Um, and it should just feel a bit difficult. 
So if you try to do it to the level of dining room chair, and there's just no ways you can control it, add cushions to the top of that chair so that until you find the height that is comfortable for you and that you can control it properly. And if you find that your control is all over the show, place your hand against the wall and first get really strong on one leg with the stability and then take the, the hand away and start working on the control part. So absolutely break this exercise up and work on one bit at a time to eventually get to the full one. While you're doing it, you want to think about pushing your bum out to the back. You can have your arms out to the front if you feel that it, it helps you stabilize or you can have it there. Um, also, you're looking, you have to make sure that your knee moves in line with the middle of your foot and that your foot doesn't roll in so that you're really looking for that control. If you can't do that, higher surface. How often can you do these? Really only do them twice a week. If you're really fit, you may be able to do them three times a week. But at this stage, you're usually also doing lots of other sports. So twice a week is more than enough and leave at least two recovery days in between. So you make sure you're getting that proper recovery. Then the last type of exercise I want to talk about are plyometrics. And I'm gonna demonstrate double leg hops but there are a wide variety of plyometric exercises you can do in this stage. And if you're somebody who does jumping sports or sports where there's quick change of direction, you definitely need to be doing more than just one type of plyometric. You need to be adding those things in. But I'm gonna discuss the, the double leg hops because they are an easy one that most people can do. And they are pretty good for if you're a runner to add them in. Now, somebody who just walks and has no interest in running or jumping sports, you do not have to do these. And it's actually better if you don't do them because your body won't be used to this type of activity. So what you want, you definitely want to wear shoes because you want to support your feet and you want to make it as close to what you would be wearing when you do your sport. Now, the key is to understand that the higher you jump, the harder everything has to work. So it's usually best to start with gentle, small jumps, light jumps, and just again, check your 24 hour response to them. Now for the double leg hops, imagine you want to hop as if you can hop all day. So somebody's telling you, you're gonna hop for five hours now in one go, get going. You wouldn't be hopping up and down like that. You would just go into a nice easy rhythm and that's what you do. So we start with about 10 to 20 hops in one go, rest for one to two minutes, and test what three sets of that does. So usually over several sessions and over several weeks, I build my patients up to where they can do um, five sets of 20 to 40 hops, depending on their sports, with enough rest period in between. Um, other thing to think about is that these are quite high load exercises. So once a week is sometimes enough, but you can do plyometrics up to twice a week. It all depends on what else you're doing in your, um, in, your, in your training plan. Now remember, if you feel you want a bit more guidance with all your rehab, and like for instance, a proper plyometric program to add in with your return to running plan, check out the plantar fasciitis treatment plan in the Exact Health app. You can get one month for free if you use the discount code. And I have helped design it that it takes all of these concepts and principles into consideration and really helps you guide your rehab according to your symptoms and according to your level and your ability and your foot's tolerance to the exercises. Brilliant. Hope you found that useful. Now remember, if you would like more help with an injury, you're welcome to consult one of the team by a video call. The link to our website is in the description of this video. Take care.